Hello, I'm Jill Britton, Technical Support Manager at Programming Research, a leading exponent of static analysis. Today, I'm going to be talking about software metrics. Software metrics are quantitative measures of software development which are used across the whole software development lifecycle. First, we will consider why we use software metrics at all and what phases of the software lifecycle will benefit the most from them. Next, we will look at the pros and cons of the most commonly used metrics. And finally, how metrics are used to enforce standards. So, why should we use software metrics? They help in the planning of the project and they use early in the cycle for example, in the requirements and design phases, can avert future quality issues. They are an aid to performance optimization, and most commonly are considered a measure of software quality. What is important is to place software metrics in the context of continuous improvement. However, there is opposition to the concept of software metrics. They take time to collect and need to be carefully selected so that they are relevant to the project phase and environment. There is no best measure, no one size fits all. Different metrics are relevant to each part of the system and phase of the project. Every environment is different and just because a metric was used in a previous project does not mean that it is relevant to the current project. There is no correct set of metrics or indeed a final set as use may show that a selected metric is not relevant or some different measure is needed. It is difficult to select the set of metrics which give the quality coverage required. However, in any organisation, it is necessary to have a set of metrics that are well understood, clearly defined and unambiguous. Metric selection should be practical, realistic and pragmatic, taking into consideration the process in place. Additionally, the cost of gathering the metrics versus the benefit gained from them should be a factor in the selection. Each phase of the software development life cycle has its own set of relevant metrics. The requirements phase may be measured on the number of users interviewed or maybe the type of user. This would show the breadth of the input. Once the requirements are written, the number of shalls, as in the sh software shall do something, as opposed to the software should do something, can be counted. Using data from previous projects, the number of defects traced back to the requirements phase could be used to prevent the same errors occurring again. The planning phase relies on previous experience to determine software size and resources needed while the development phase refines such metrics as the project progresses. It may also be that by reviewing the value produced in the design phase against that from the planning phase, an issue may be highlighted. The design may produce far more software than planned, or more resources may be needed. The planning then has to be revisited and the design reviewed. The coding phase introduces probably the most well-known of software metrics, for example lines of code and static path count, which will be discussed later. Testing gives an indication of the quality of the software before it is released, but the values produced must be put in context. The number of test cases run needs to be related to the number of test cases available. Some values need to be fed back to earlier phases. 
The number of test failures may indicate a problem in the coding, design or even requirements phase. Are the test cases correct? Is there something missing in the review stage? Is there something in the requirements which could have been misinterpreted? Metrics in the maintenance phase are used for retrospective review or future planning. The number of defects found once a product is in the field should obviously be minimised. If it is high, what could be done to improve things in the future? So to the metrics used in the coding phase. Lines of code was first defined over 30 years ago by Maccabi. It's a size metric and is still widely used. It's interesting to note that many later metrics are still based around this initial concept. Lines of code is, in theory, easy to evaluate. Just count the lines in a program. But what exactly is a line of code? Is it a logical line? Are comments included? What about macros? The example shown could be just one line, but logically it is two. And there is also a comment, always useful to count these as they give an indication of the maintainability of the code. All these factors have caused much discussion of the value of this metric. However, within a project, where the definition of lines of code is consistent, it provides a good indicator of complexity and ease of maintenance. A more complex alternative to lines of code is function point analysis defined by Albrecht. This is another size metric, but uses the sum of five factors relating to user requirements. These are inputs, outputs, logic files, inquiries and interfaces. This sum is then adjusted by applying complexity measures. The method is widely used and has been shown by experiment to be a valid measurement. Function points are an early indicator of rising or excessive complexity in the software lifecycle yielding a more timely corrective action. However, care should be taken as the complexity factors are arbitrary, subjective, based on the developer's judgment, and there is no empirical evidence to indicate which values should be used. Cyclomatic complexity belongs to a separate group of metrics called control flow metrics. This is a count of the linearly independent paths through the code. The premise is that the more complicated the control flow, the higher the value and the more complex the code. Maccabi suggested that 10 is a good limiting factor for cyclomatic complexity and this number is certainly the most widely used. However, this simple value is not sufficient. The blue line on the diagram shows a cyclomatic complexity of 10. It's obvious that many of the functions shown are way above this. Thus, it is more useful to consider the risk associated with each value. The values suggested are low risk up to 10, moderate 11 to 20, high risk 21 to 50 and anything above 50 may be untestable and should be examined carefully. Cyclometric complexity can be used in two ways to limit the complexity of the code or to define the number of test cases necessary. But is it any better at finding defects than lines of code? That is a subject of great controversy and I refer you to the many papers written about it. Trending is an important aspect of the use of any software metrics. Trends show how the code has changed between versions. 
They don't indicate if the change is good or bad, but may indicate that there is an area of concern that should be investigated. To measure change in any software metric, the method of capture must be consistent between versions. Here, the tool such as QA Verify from Programming Research is invaluable as distinct code versions may be accessed and metrics calculated and stored for later comparison. The metric calculation is exactly the same for each version and the results are reproducible. This graph, produced using QA Verify, shows how cyclomatic complexity and lines of code changed over six versions of code. As you can see, both are steadily increasing as more code is developed and added to the release. However, in version 10.2, cyclomatic complexity suddenly drops. This needs investigating. What's changed? It might be an improvement, but maybe an error. In this particular case, it's caused by the introduction of a macro, so it's not an area for concern. Standards advocate the use of metrics to define levels of quality. Hestella Initiative software, HIS, provides very clear detail of the software metrics required. They are divided into metrics with limits, which measure the complexity of the code, and metrics without limits, which measure change and are used to calculate a stability index. The stability index is actually a metric with limits. Metrics with limits, such as those shown, can be calculated directly from the code. The standard itself shows the acceptable limits. There are 15 of these metrics specified in the HIS document, each with specified limits. For example, number of paths should be between 1 and 80. Tools are available to perform these calculations. For example, QAC from Programming Research is listed in the HIS document. Metrics without limits relate to the changes between versions and are basically trends as discussed previously. As implied in the name, no limits are specified, but the values must be stated. These metrics are derivatives of lines of code as described previously and are pure measured values. The metrics needed to calculate the stability index are the lines of code changed between current and previous versions, the lines deleted and the lines added. ISO IEC 25018 takes a different approach and instead of specifying particular metrics provides characteristics which should be used to define a quality model. The characteristics include functionality, maintainability and portability. Security and compatibility were added when this standard was revised in 2011. Each characteristic should be capable of yielding a number of measurable properties. So when selecting metrics, it should be ensured they are quantifiable and measure one or more of the characteristics that are to be examined. In conclusion, selecting and gathering appropriate metrics is time consuming and takes resources. If the metrics are not used, it is a waste of both time and resource. However, if appropriate metrics are selected and the data analysed and used, they can be very valuable to measure progress, current quality and be an aid in future improvement. We've come to the end of the presentation. Thank you for listening. I hope that you found it of interest. Please feel free to contact me if you have any questions or would like further information.